Hello and welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. Today we've got a special guest with us, as always, but uh, maybe this one's a little bit different. You know, we, a lot of times we bring in charter captains, but I also love to interview just kind of normal guys that are out there doing the, the Great Lakes trolling thing. And today we are joined by Alex Schlichting. He is a Northwest Wisconsin experienced Lake Superior angler. Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, good to have you on. And the reason that I'm going to have you on today is because you're going to talk about something that we haven't talked about yet on the show. I know we had Travis White on um, a few, maybe about a year ago, and he talked a little bit about this area. But uh, this is an area that you fish quite often. It's the Apostle Islands and Lake Superior. And it's an area that I've visited before, but I've never actually uh, put a boat in the water there. So I'm kind of excited to hear about it. Uh, first of all, Alex, Tell us a little bit about the Apostle Island areas and, and what's so special about it to you. Uh, sure. Yep. Um, you know, most, the most important thing to me is just the beauty of being out in the islands and, uh, you know, just the, the different views that you get to see. Uh, and then it provides excellent fishing year round, um, whether that's in a small 14 foot boat, a kayak, all the way up to your 25 foot boats that you're seeing charters run out of the uh, bay there. So just a really beautiful and remarkable area there, the Apostle Islands. You talked about boats. Tell us about your boat. What are you running? How are you fishing this area? Uh, so I'm I'm just running an 18 foot of Lumacraft. Uh, as far as big water goes, it's nothing special. Um, when I first started going out there, it was a lot of long lining, um, throwing snap weights out. And this is a great time in the spring and the fall now. Uh, to be out doing that kind of stuff. So I didn't start with anything special. Um, small boat with a 115 on it, you really don't need much. And uh, I, I can tell you it's very addicting to be out there. And by time summer hits and those fish move a little bit deeper and kind of spread out of the islands, you're you're pretty much hooked. You're going to be want to, you're going to be buying downriggers. Um, a fish hawk is, is a huge tool out there. Uh, and then just better electronics for being in that deeper water. Yeah, you talked a little bit there about uh, you first started just using long lines and snap weights and now kind of upgrading more as you go. Tell me a little bit about when you're out there fishing, let's say you're going to go trolling tomorrow out there. What does that setup look like? I mean, what are you running for rods? How are you deploying your lines and covering the water column? Sure. Uh, so this time of year specifically, um, we're kind of reverting back to our spring tactics as the fish are coming into the river mouse to spawn. Um, I This time of year, I'm really running probably four planer boards and two long lines, nothing special. Um, scatter wraps on a couple of those. Uh, I might run some lead core to get some uh, stick baits down a little bit deeper. And, uh, you know, I might throw the downriggers out to drop you know some spoons down to 30 feet down but for the most part we're catching uh browns coho splake uh, right out in front of the river mouse we're fishing anywhere from 50 to 100 feet of water but we're always consistently fishing that top 30 feet of the water section so that's your kind of fall spring pattern tell me about the summer what's it like i mean when i think of that area i kind of think of it being a lake trout fishery but you're talking about cohos you're talking about brown trout tell us what it's like the kind of the seasonalities as the seasons go on out there sure yep so i'll just start with spring um awesome near for uh near shore fishing like i said you're going to be getting um good coho splake browns uh, and you'll get your lakers mixed in there uh, just with the cooler water temps closer to shore. Uh, that time of year, we're simply long lining and using planer boards. Um, like I said, trolling 100 feet of water or less, but we're always fishing that top section of the water. Um, baits that I use in the spring, mostly scatter apps, husky jerks, reef runners, um, maybe some flicker minnows all in that four to five inch length. And then uh, moonshine and pro king magnums work best. Um, so then as we move into the summer, this is probably one of my favorite times to be out there. Um, that water starts to warm up and it gets a lot warmer than what the rest of uh, Lake Superior gets. Uh, so the fish start moving out deeper. Uh, the salmon are moving out of the islands and spreading out. So they're a little bit tougher to find in a small boat. Um, but Lakers, they tend to find that comfortable water towards the outer islands there. 
Um, this is where the downriggers really come into play. Um, we're running the entire water column. Anywhere from uh, 70 to 200 feet of water, I'm finding fish. And um, you're really just looking for that cooler water and following the bait schools out there. So a typical spread in the summer for me, if I'm going to go trolling, um, I've got two downriggers. They're pretty basic, just manual crank cannons. Uh, and I'm running stacker clips on those at alternate depths. So for instance, if I'm fishing hundred feet of water, um, downrigger one, I'll call it, uh, that one's set at 90 feet of water and I've got the, uh, stacker on that downrigger set at 60 on downrigger two. Uh, I've got that ball down to 75 feet of water and I'm running the stacker at 45. So I'm basically covering 45, 60, 75, 90 feet of water down that column. Um, and I can uh, throw a couple of planer boards out, one with a snap weight, trying to get it roughly down to 30 and one with no weight at 10 feet under the surface. So that allows me to cover that entire water column um, and then dial in and make a, a, an adjustment where, uh, where I'm finding the most fish, either bringing baits up or dropping them down. Um, so best, best rigs for me this, uh, during the summer with, with the uh, Apostle Islands there, I'm using flashers with spinning glows, uh, flasher fly, moonshine and pro king magnum spoons for sure. And I'll probably still run some scatter apps higher in the column. Um, pretty basic setup. And uh, the best part uh, to summer fishing out in the islands for me is we do have a fair amount of structure. Uh, so like shoals, wrecks, um, weed lines, and uh, jigging for lake trout over structure is a blast this time of year. Uh, typically we're in that 70 to 100 feet of water, sometimes deeper um, and uh, almost always using white tubes, jigging spoons or bondy baits. Uh, and that's how we catch our bigger fish of the year is jigging for them during the summer. So uh, white fish jigging is also a great time, um, especially as spring transfers into summer, kind of that uh, middle ground the white fish are biting like crazy out there. It's, it's really a good time. Um, yeah, and that's something, that's something that some of our friends maybe on Lake Ontario probably don't do a whole lot of. Tell us about that white fish bite, what that's like. And then, you know, the, the great thing about that white fish bite is just the table fare that you're going to get from them. Yeah, it really is. They're, uh, they're an awesome table fare. You're going to also catch a mixed bag uh, going for them. So, in the Apostle Islands, you end up catching um, a decent amount of walleye doing it, uh, as well as your mixed in trout or salmon that are just kind of nomad fish. They're just roaming in there. Um, but to get on the, the white fish, it's, uh, it's a little bit of just a searching around a certain area, certain water temps. Um, and usually you can find them right outside the marinas. And I'm just using ice fishing spoons. I mean, it's... Um, Really, to me, I'm sure everyone's got their way of doing it, but to me, it's pretty basic. It's just an ice fishing, usually a 5 a sound spoon, uh, 40 feet of water, and when you get into them, you really get into them. It's a, it's a blast. Very cool. Let's talk a little bit about, the, you said uh, you're just yeah. outside the marina for that whitefish bite. What, what marina are you running out of? Uh, what port are you using as kind of your home port? And when you're going out to troll, what, what kind of run are you making to get to where you're starting to put your gear down? Uh, so it really depends on the time of year. Um, spring, I am usually going right out of Washburn, Wisconsin. It's um, it's real close to near shore trout and salmon fishing. Um, there's a great marina there that offers good whitefish fishing. Um, and then as the summer goes on, I need to get deep out into the islands. There's uh, Bayfield Marina just north of Washburn, uh, as well as Red Cliff Casino. They have a great boat launch and marina. Uh, that's also just a little bit north of um, of Bayfield there. So it's really limiting and cutting down my boat ride, uh, especially being in a smaller boat. I just, uh, if I know I'm going to go further out uh, trolling midsummer and I'm going to have to get out to those outer islands, I'm going to choose the boat launch closest out there, which is Red Cliff Casino. Yeah, so having that trailerable boat just makes it a lot easier because you're you're putting miles on the wheels instead of on the boat. Uh, gets you a little smoother ride on the highway rather than on the lake. But oh, yeah. you know that's obviously an advantage. But 
you know, Lake Superior is really well known for being a lake that can really kick up and get pretty nasty pretty quick. Uh, tell me about kind of what you need to do to stay safe on the water out there. Um, so first and foremost, I mean, I'm watching the weather. If I've got a trip planned for this weekend, I'm watching the weather throughout the week. Um, the NOAA uh, near shore marine forecast, that is the most accurate and best one that I always use. I'm watching that every day um, and checking it right before I go out. Uh, that'll give you wave height, water temp, um, different uh, um, pressures coming into the system and everything. And, and you can definitely get a feel for how that weather is going to shake out for you. Um, on top of just checking your weather, you know, having all of the safety equipment out there, flares, air horn, in case you ever need that. Um, that's always been important to me and it is required out there as well by the uh, Coast Guard. So it's always just uh, making sure you got everything you need to be safe. And uh, if you are very far out in these islands and you feel the wind completely shift, definitely keep an eye on it and head back sooner than later. Uh, it's just not worth being stuck out there um, in a big storm. And, you know, the islands do give you a fair amount of protection and it's always nice being able to head to an island if you needed to, um, but you certainly don't want to be stuck out on that island. Right. Uh, you talked about structure. What What is that bottom like? I mean, I've fished uh, the North Shore of Minnesota before, and you've got a lot of volcanic rock over there. But you and I were talking a week or so ago about this, and you said you've got a lot of sand on the bottom over there. So a lot of the time when I'm trolling, um, or jigging for that matter, uh, rocks really aren't a concern. Uh, I know a lot of people are, are worried about hanging their downrigger ball up in rocks or um one of the biggest hazards we have out there are fish nets. There's a lot of commercial fishing in that area uh, as far as getting your, your downriggers stuck in stuff. Um, but as far as our general structure, for the most part, it's sand. Um, near shore and definitely in the bay, we have good weed lines. Um, and then as you get out into the islands, a lot of them typically have a shoal, um, a good rock pile. And it's, it's uh, definitely not as pronounced as you're seeing on the North Shore. Um, but you will find structure here and there. Those are the places that you want to definitely stop, scan around and jig. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at sandy bottoms all the way through. I think one of the things you also said when we were talking about structure a little while ago was uh, wrecks. And I think that's something that people, when they think of Lake Superior, you know, you think of the Edmund Fitzgerald, you think of a lot of wrecks, especially around the islands there. Tell us a bit, little bit about that and kind of what's what you encounter there when you're chasing those things down. Um, so a lot of them are a little bit further than uh, what I can typically get out to, uh, unless it's a very calm day. But uh, typically you're going to, you're going to stumble upon um, just a lot of structure in on your graph there. And uh, the jigging can be either great or non-existent in my experience. Um, typically there's, there's fish around. I haven't done a, uh, a ton of fishing around these. Typically I focus my time on these shoals and uh, in rock spots in the, in the lake, but um, they are there and they can attract fish uh, typically certain times a year, uh, especially when the bait fish are moving. Tell me about what a typical day would be like if you're going to go trolling. I know you got a little bit of a drive to get to the lake. Tell me about, you know, let's say you and I were going to put a trip together for next week. What would our day look like? Sure. Um, this time of year, uh, it's for me, it's about a three hour drive. So it's getting up real early. Um, getting there before light is always a big priority for me. I always have great fishing early in the morning. Um, get out. Uh, I'm probably going to spend the first half an hour to an hour trying to find water conditions I like, um, marking fish, marking spots, marking bait. Um, and then from there, it's it's really keying in on where those fish are in the water column, deploying the baits and, um, you know, starting at one spot and moving to the, to the next there. And how, how uh, long of a day? I mean, what is what is the, I guess velocity and what are we talking about here because i know one thing that people think about and they think of lake superior is it's it's really a sterile body of water it's very very cold um you know what's a typical day in the in the live well look like for you um 
So I, I typically spend all day out there and that's just because I have a longer drive. Uh, it's not worth it for me to drive three hours, fish two, and then drive three home. Um, so I'm out there for the day. Uh, usually I have a great run right away in the morning. Uh, pretty good mix bag, um, especially this time of year. And as the uh, day goes on, usually we get to midday and it kind of slows down and then it'll pick back up yeah, mid to late afternoon. Uh, and then just before dark, it shuts off again. Um, so typically I'm, I'm leaving the lake by uh, six, seven o'clock this time of year, uh, just before dark, I'm off the water already. Uh, but you know, this time of year, if you're on the bait and you're on the fish, uh, you can come home with, you know, a good handful of salmon, six, seven salmon, um, couple Lakers, possibly a Brown. It, uh, it's always a different scenario out there. It's yeah. Tell me a little bit about the forage base out there. What are these fish eating? in your neck of the woods? Um, so for the most part, it's melt. Uh, that's our number one bait fish. There are a lot of them in the islands. It's a perfect spot for them. Um, the lake trout and salmon are also eating the herring out of here. Um, and, uh, you know, this year specifically, as that age class of smelt and herring have grown up, you've also watched all of the predators become much larger. So typically we're seeing 18 to 20 inch um, coho salmon usually two to three pounds, nothing, nothing real big. Uh, and that's on a typical year. This year we were seeing um, upwards of 10 pound coho salmon uh, in that 26, 27 inch range. Yeah, that's, that's a humongous coho salmon uh, for the Lake Superior. I know that they caught the state record. I think I heard they caught it like three times in a week or something like that on the Minnesota side this year. And uh, just talking to some of the Minnesota biologists about Lake Superior, um, just food sources were just really, really good this year. And, and they, they said there's going to be a lot of fish out there, but they're going to be somewhat hard to catch because they had full bellies. So what was, what was your experience like there? Uh, this year was by far my best year catching salmon out there. Um, again, running scatter apps, um, reef runners, and uh, and just pro king spoons. Uh, I mean, it, it just seemed like you couldn't keep them off the hook. They were everywhere, uh, mostly in that top 50 feet of the water column. And wherever you would find bait, you'd find the cohos. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a lot of fun. Tell me a little bit of, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you came today and you wanted to talk about? Um, you know, one other really cool aspect that we have in Chequamegon Bay and the islands really is uh, a little bit of ice fishing that uh, you don't really find in a lot of places on the Great Lakes. Um, we get a very good ice in in the uh, southern portion of the Chequamegon Bay. Uh, and that kind of, as winter progresses, moves from the south end all the way and it freezes the entire bay over um you know the the uh early ice fishing can be great down in the bay uh you're catching a lot of walleye perch pike uh the occasional trout and white fish too um and then as winter moves into uh you know mid january and later that ice has moved out towards the islands out of the bay uh, and this is when we have great near shore ice fishing for brown trout splake lake trout, coho is white fish. Um, and then that ice will actually continue expanding through February, early March. And this is when we're really getting into um, big lake trout. Uh, people love bobbing for lake trout out there. And uh, it is probably one of my favorite times of year. It's uh, an awesome place to go ice fishing. Um, biggest thing with that is we, we've got a lot of currents and a lot of different weather conditions up there. So I just want to stress, always be safe. Uh, chisel your way out and find a safe route. Don't trust other people's tracks and, uh, you know, wear a float suit. Uh, it can be very dangerous. So just take your time and, uh, and play it safe out there. Yeah. The idea of pulling a lake trout through the ice, I think appeals to a lot of people. Certainly appeals to me. It just sounds like a whole lot of fun. Um, we are the great lakes fishing podcast. We like to talk about the great lakes. Um, if there is a place, Alex, that you haven't gone fishing on the Great Lakes, tell me what kind of your your bucket list lo location, the place that you want to go on the Great Lakes that you haven't gone to yet. Um, so it's kind of funny. Well, two places. Uh, one, I would love to go summer fishing. Um, Isle Royal, that's uh, kind of a bucket list trip for me. 
And, uh, you know, being so close to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I don't get over there as much as I get up to the islands. Um, usually out of preference, just because I like being out in the islands. Uh, but I would love to do the uh, brown trout ice fishing over in uh, Milwaukee there. Very good, Alex. We really appreciate you taking some time to talk to us. It was fun to talk to you. Uh, it was great talking to you. And, and the Apostle Islands just uh, are kind of a, a storybook type of place to go fishing. And uh, it sounds like you've got it pretty dialed in. Sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, I might have to run up there someday and, and join you on a boat. Absolutely. I'd love to have you, Chris. All right. He's Alex Schlichting. Thanks so much for listening today. And we'll talk to you next week.